Welcome home. We are WNST, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We are positively in Florida, uh, coming at you semi-live. We're here for the NFL owners meetings, chasing Steve Bishotti, John Harbaugh, Chad Steele, Eric DaCosta, and others around. Uh, and uh, been in southwest part of Florida for the last uh, couple of days in Fort Myers with the uh, Red Sox and Sarasota with the Orioles, um, the Pirates, other teams, rainouts, all sorts of things, and the death of uh, Peter G. Angelos. We discussed that at length. You can find that at a Baltimore Positive. We're also going to be doing the opening day on Thursday. Uh, you'll see Luke at the ballpark. I don't know if I'll be I'll be at the ballpark. I don't know if I'll be a real media member or not. Depends on when Dave Rubenstein buys team. Um, and we're going to have football on the brain. You're going to be having breakfast with John Harbaugh and talking about rules and players and cornerbacks they've signed and Brent Urban. Like all that stuff's going to happen. But Boy, opening day is different, man. I mean, I just being down in Florida for a couple of days with you and feeling the energy for it. Um, you talk to some players. I know you're going to have Austin Hayes on the show uh, this week. Um, what do you make of it? You, I mean, you and I have been spending three, four days together down here. We haven't talked a lot of baseball, believe it or not, just us hanging out. Um, what do you make of the experience of all this and seeing all this energy in that locker room? Well, I get the sense that they're ready for opening day. It, it is funny being – down in spring training, being in Sarasota the last few days that they're there, you really get the sense that, all right, it's go time. Uh, I can recall, I think it was after Wednesday night's game, I believe it was, Anthony Santander was actually backing his vehicle toward the facility and you know having his bats packed up. And I think he was having someone drive his vehicle to Baltimore, quite frankly, because uh, he was down there and you know, wanted his vehicle and it was loading up equipment and some of his stuff that he had down here and logistics, you know, logistics. Ready to go. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of that going on. And obviously uh, front of mind is all, are, are all the roster moves and we'll get to Jackson holiday in a moment. Cause there's plenty of meat on the bone there, but you know, it's go time. Uh, you know, talking to Austin Hayes, uh, as you alluded to, I had a chance to spend a few minutes with him and he was actually a unique story because he was under the weather, you know, I missed about a week. Uh, with a little bit of a stomach bug he had going on. And, but I asked him, you know, how do you know when you're ready? And, I mean, it's not like this profound light bulb moment for, for any of these guys. But I think, especially on the hitting side, they get enough at-bats under their belt. You know, in Grapefruit League, first few weeks, you're getting your timing. And then I think for the most part, you're ready to go. You know, that whether you're going to get off to an amazing start and the ball looks like a beach ball on opening day and you hit a home run or whether you get off to a slower start, I think guys are ready to embrace the grind of a six-month season. I mean, you you don't take it lightly because it is a long season. Um, on the pitching side, it's much more, you know, much more systematic in terms of, okay, you start out first couple outings, you're pitching an inning, maybe two innings. And, you know, how many ups are you getting? All, all that. And you, you see the the weird spring training scenarios where someone's pitch count gets up. Brandon Hyde comes out, takes them out of the game. They bring in a, a minor league pitcher coming over from the minor league camp. And then the starter goes back in the following inning uh, because he's, uh, you know, trying to get his pitch count up. So it, it's very, you know, as someone who, one had not covered spring training in a number of years, and I have not been someone who's covered Grapefruit League games. You know, when I've been down here in the past, it was before the games have started. It, it is a, it's a different vibe. It's definitely a different sense. But pitchers out of the game, get down to the bullpen and talk to them because it's yeah. inning. Oh, you, totally you, right. Yeah, I mean, exactly. well, it's weird. You might miss a home run. You might miss a couple of runs being scored. Whatever it is, but by and large, these guys are ready to go. Uh, I think these guys know expectations are much higher for them. Than they've been in a very long time. You know, even last year, there was still a sense of, okay, how real was the second half of uh, of 22? Are they ready to take off? Or are they going to be a team that's in wild card contention, but probably not a division contender? And we saw how that worked out when they ran away with the AL, you know, won the AL East, didn't run away with it. Tampa Bay was right there, but 101 games. So they know the expectations are high. I, I think... The way the season ended for them last October uh, in disappointing fashion, albeit to the eventual World Series champions, uh, I think that was motivation for them. But I think uh, there, there's definitely a balancing act here of understanding that you can't make the postseason in April. Uh, but we always talk about the flip side of that. You don't want to put yourself in a hole either. So I think they're as ready as they're going to be from a health standpoint, obviously, Bradish and Means, even though Mike Elias gave another encouraging update uh, a couple days ago. Uh, we'll see how that continues to unfold. But other than those two, and obviously Felix Batista, 
uh, who we know is already out for the year. They're about as healthy as you'd want them to be otherwise, and it's go time. And I think while there are certainly some questions on this team, and you know we can certainly second guess a couple roster decisions here or there, and that's what makes it fun. The fact that people care so much is what makes it fun. You know, there's a lot of excitement, and I think this team has very high expectations for themselves, as they should, coming off a 2023 season as special as it was. Burns. Let's talk about Burns a little bit. Uh, you know, Friday night, the game got banged, uh, trying to get the right amount of work for a guy who clearly is a veteran, knows what he's doing. Yeah. What a sort of coming out party. I mean, they have a new owner on Thursday, that, that carpet's going to get rolled out, the tuxedos and all that stuff. But I mean... We talked about this a lot in the in the, the piece with the with Angelos's death. It's, it's a fresh start and it's a fresh season. And I, I think a lot of people, the Jackson holiday thing, it was let's go back to that for a minute and a half, because like we didn't talk about it, it was all you talked about in the car Friday. It's all we talked about Saturday morning before Peter died. Then Peter died and everything's changed. And now we're oh, the game's in a minute and holiday's not here. What's the situation with him? And, you know, if you'll. Feel free to, you know, expound upon it because I think it 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 was um disappointing to the fans and I think a little bit perplexing to you given Elias's um smoke signals that were coming out and, yeah. and um but also the, the reality of of his inexperience speaks for itself. I mean, it don't bring 20-year-olds up very often. And also the reality of yes, Mike Elias does have to consider the, p- the potential to have Jackson Holiday under club control for 2030. Now, I'm not saying that should be paramount or that that should drive the decision or that this is the right decision, but that's also a factor. And it's one a $40 thing million I'm, dollar decision, and it's a year. It's a, it's a big decision. 40. It might by then. I mean, we're talking six years from now. That might be a $60 million decision right then. I mean, who knows? If he's truly the MVP caliber kind of guy that he looks like he could end up being one day, I mean, you never know. But – I think for me, first of all, it's so funny, Nestor, because if you had asked me if Jackson Holiday would be on the opening day roster back in October, I would have said no. And it would have been all of the reasons that Mike Elias laid out on, what was it, Friday? It feels like a long time ago, uh, to your point, uh, with, with the Peter Angelos news over the weekend. You know, the first I, thing I you would say is service time. And then the second thing you'd say is service time. And the third thing you'd say is service time at Scott Boris. But, and then you could talk about him hitting 300 at spring training and playing his way onto the team and people's well, minds. But, but the reason I would have said no, okay, service time's part of it. But keep in mind, you also do have some different variables now. You do have the prospect perf- – you know, prospect uh, – performance uh, incentive, you know, uh, in term or uh, sorry, prospect promotion incentive uh, in terms of what happened with the Orioles with Gunnar Henderson last year. Oh, they Gunnar Henderson wins rookie of the year. The Orioles got the 32nd pick uh, in this cut in this summer's draft. So uh, there's that. Uh, We saw what happened with Adley Rutschman two years ago, which albeit that was because of the injury. You know, he had the triceps issue uh, in spring training and that delayed his you know, wasn't going to be on the opening day roster, whether he was truly going to be on it or not again, up for debate. And maybe this decision gives us a little bit of insight into maybe that answer would have been no. Uh, but you know, all that aside, I would have said to you, look, he's 20 years old. He's not going to be 21 until December. He's learning a new position. He played second base on average about once a week last year, the, the Orioles value defense, by the way, we've seen that, you know, defense matters uh, for them uh, and they play a lot of close games. We've talked about that the last couple of years. So defense matters on that front. And the other thing uh, that Elias laid out now, he specifically went into more uh, holiday, his lack of facing a lot of major league red, you know, major league caliber left-handed pitching. And obviously he's a left-handed swinger and even said, went as far to say he hasn't seen a lot of, of triple A caliber left-handed pitching and this is where i'll I'll say this is where we need to remind ourselves and you mentioned corbin burns i'll use him as an example go look at corbin burns spring training stats not great this this spring you know he gave up a lot of home runs you know i i've seen some people concerned i'm not uh, i'm not until i see actual games that matter for for me to have a reason to be concerned the point is you know around 5 30 on thursday Correct. The point <laughs> is, the point is there is so much statistical noise in the Grapefruit League. And I said this to you the other day. Grapefruit League baseball is not Major League Baseball. 
it's Major League Baseball mixed in with triple A pitchers and double A pitchers, and sometimes even a stray single A pitcher. So I think from that standpoint, that's where we do need to look at the the stats that he put up in the Grapefruit League, which were impressive. I mean, this kid hit a couple home runs. He hit over 300. Uh, he, I, I know his numbers against left-handed pitching weren't as good, but he did hit a, a home run uh, against uh, you know, a major league pitcher. You know, he had a grand slam against the left-handed major league starter, uh, who was an all-star a few years ago, K- uh, Kikuchi for Toronto. So all of that's there, but I'll come back to the point that I took my biggest issue with, and this is what I focused in on at BaltimorePositive.com. Everything that Mike Elias just laid out, and I just gave you a summary of much of what he had to say. And he even he even alluded to the fact that Gunnar Henderson, who roughly a year and a half older than Jackson Holiday as a rookie, uh, he struggled against left-handed pitching as well uh, early on uh, in his you know his first few months in the majors. Uh, so all of those elements were true. But where I keep kept coming back to this, and where I took some issue with this in terms of the negative reaction that fans had. And I think fans are justified to, to a point. Let's not cancel opening day over this. It's going to be I thought a little bit. It was over the top. He's a 20 year old kid. He'll right, be up right. in six weeks and but, yeah, you know, they'll be I fine. Think, but the thing I think that bothered me is I think the messaging and the managing of expectations could have been way better here. I think Elias had every opportunity throughout the off season, instead of continuing to say, Hey, he's got a chance to be on the opening day roster at one point in the winter meetings. I think he said he had a very good chance uh, to be on the major league opening day roster. And I think based on how this played out based on the way that he performed to a level where you'd say, if he had to win a job or he had the opportunity to win a job, I think he did it from, from in terms of performance. Now, again, spring training, Grapefruit League numbers are only part of the evaluation. But I guess for me, it's if this was truly a case where he really didn't have a shot of cracking the 26 man roster on opening day, short of Gunnar Henderson going on the D on the IL with an oblique and Ramon Arias spraining his ankle or Mateo tweaking his knee, you know, let's say two of their incumbent infielders had to would have had to have landed on I on the IL for Jackson Holiday to make the, the club, then don't blow up all the hype about his chances. Don't tout his chances for being on the opening day roster because you could have done the opposite, Nestor. You could have said all along, look, we're not putting pressure on this kid. He's 20 years old. He's got a lot that he still needs to work on. Yeah, he's so ahead of the game. I mean, my goodness, he was 19 at AAA, but let's pump the brakes here, guys. And you know what? He could have said that. And then if Jackson Holiday looked like Babe Ruth throughout the spring to the point where they decided, you know what, we're going to put him on the major league roster. Guess what? Fans would have been elated about that. No one, no one would have been mad about that. But if you, if that had been the messaging throughout the off season, winter meetings, a uh, Sirius XM, MLB network radio interview, you know, I, I, and I even linked to a couple of those, you know, uh, you know, I found a couple tweets from over the off season linking to some of his comments. If that had been the messaging, and then he was sent down. Yeah, some fans would have been mad because some people just want to be mad about things. And I get that. And that's, and that's true of sports, politics, whatever it is. You know, uh, that, that's just kind of society. I'd say I met Ron DeSantis. But I'm not getting into any of that. Yeah. But I think I, was thrilled. There, Can't you tell I think there would have been a much more understanding and, and probably a, maybe the word would have been resignation. Look, Elias said all winter that didn't make it sound like Jackson Holiday was going to be on the team. And yeah, he put up some numbers. At the same time, Kyle Stowers hit seven home runs and he's going back to Norfolk. Corbin Burns had a shaky statistical Grapefruit League profile, you know, if, if for whatever that's worth, which is nothing in my mind. Uh, to, again, to my point, as far as let's see him pitching a real game uh, before we're going to even suggest there's anything to be concerned about. Uh, if that had been the messaging, I think this would have gone over way better than it did. And that's my criticism. Do I think for really the proof's going to be in the pudding, Nestor? I mean, it, it looks like, and I don't know this for sure, as you and I are speaking a few days before opening day, there could always be a waiver wire edition. There can always be an injury that comes out of nowhere. There could be some, some changes on that front, but it's looking like it could be someone like Tyler Nevin being on the 26 man roster. Look, it, it, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and try to say the Orioles are 
you know, there's no questioning them putting their foot best foot forward if you're taking Tyler Nevin and Jackson Holiday's uh, going back to Triple A Norfolk. I mean, again, we understand the service time thing, but I think what's interesting here is the potential ramifications. Okay, what happens if you're thinking about the Adley Rutschman scenario where he comes up in late May and, and still finished second in Rookie of the Year two years ago? He gets a full, he got a full year of service time. So under that scenario, if you're Mike Elias and you're thinking in terms of service time, does that mean you're going to hold Jackson Holiday down to June or July where you eliminate any chance of him being rookie of the year? Uh, so there's that. You love sandwich picks, right? You, you like yeah. those picks. There, there's the other factor that I wrote about uh, that you have this. Well, and by the way, the sandwich pick thing, that goes out the window if he's not on the opening day roster. You don't get that. You know, I'm talking in terms of preserving the, the extra year. But if he if he gets caught up on May 21st, like Adley Rutschman did, and he finishes, if he wins rookie of the year or finishes second, he still gets the service time. And by the way, then you lost all that production that he might have helped you eke out a couple more wins earlier in the season. There's also the scenario that I presented early last week, uh, and I wrote this at BaltimorePositive.com. Adley Rutschman was 24 years old. He was more than ready when he made his major league debut. Nestor, how did his first month in the major leagues go? He Best scuffled same a as Brooks Robinson. Yeah, he scuffled a little bit. Cal Ripken hit, Cal Ripken, hit, right. hit the homer on opening day in '82, and then d- didn't hit for what about a month after that. Uh, you know, Gunnar Henderson last year, he was hitting what 180 through the first five weeks of the season, five and a half weeks of the season, to the point where there were people, not you and me, but there were people wondering, does he need to get sent down? And the, the only thing that was kind of keeping him afloat at that point was he had a high on base percentage, and you know what was flashing good defense and things of that nature, but it, it wasn't pretty. So part of my argument for saying, why not just pull the trigger, put him on the opening day roster, let him, you know, he's going to sink a little while for, he's going to struggle, but you get that out of the way. M- my thought is whether he gets caught up in, or whether it was going to be opening day, whether it was going to be April 21st, whether it's going to be May 21st or whether it's June 15th, He's probably going to scuffle a little bit when he gets caught up. That's generally how this works. And I just gave you two examples, all-star Adley Rutschman and rookie of the year, Gunnar Henderson, the last two years, a 24-year-old and a 21-year-old. And this is a 20-year-old. Well, all the old-timers tell you the biggest jumps from AAA to the big leagues, right? Correct. So yeah. so, so for me, there was an element to I'd rather bring him up sooner rather than later and let him take his licks a little bit, let him take his bumps a little bit. And then I'm hoping by, say – June, which is when Gunnar Henderson really took off and was a stud the rest of the year and was a one of the best players in the American League over the second half of the season. That was kind of my thought for Jackson Holiday. We'll see how it plays out. Or there could be the other scenario, and this is the one that ultimately, this is where this this truly needs to fall. This isn't, look, we can talk about 2030 at some point down the road, right? We can talk about all these other elements. This team's built to win right now. They just acquired Corbin Burns, you know, a Cy Young Award winner a couple years ago. It's go time. So the worst thing that could happen for me is you're holding Jackson Holiday down. He comes up, looks like an absolute stud from day one, but you got off to a slow start or maybe second base, you know, whether we're talking about Arias, whether we're talking about Mateo, whether we're talking about Jordan Westberg, whoever's playing there. You know, uh, whoever's playing They're second. They're all downgrades is, from his star at this point, but he hasn't done anything. The, the ceiling, right. right. He hasn't done anything. anything. They, they are all the higher floor players, and he's the higher ceiling player right now. But I guess my point is, if you end up getting off to a slow start, you're scuffling, and let's say, heaven forbid, you miss the playoffs by a game and a half. If you didn't call up Jackson Holiday until the end of May, and he is a stud, and you fell short, there absolutely should be second guessing there in terms of what could have happened if you had him in the opening day lineup. Now, you could also argue, well, that that time in Triple A will benefits him, and that's why he was so good when he gets called up. You know, I mean, we can go around and around on this. And again, it could end up being kids not old enough to drink a beer right now. Let's, let's pump the brakes. I mean, I and that's and that's, and that's fine. And that's fine. And that's where I keep coming back to for me. You could have managed expectations better here. Is that the end of the world? Is it that big of a deal? Does it mean I think Michael Elias stinks as a general manager? Of course not. But I do think this could have been handled better in a way of everything he told us on the backfields in Sarasota on Friday afternoon all applied back in November. And I think that's for me where it's 
if he truly never had a shot of, of of cracking the opening day roster, and really the only scenario was that three veteran infielders were going to get have to get hurt. Uh, for him to be called up, and maybe that's a scenario. You know, like look what happened with Grayson Rodriguez last year. He wasn't on the opening day roster. Bradish takes a ball off the off his foot on the, what the third game of the season or second game of the season, and suddenly, you know, he, he's in the majors two days later. So, short of that kind of scenario, you know, don't talk up his chances then. I mean, and that's and that's where I'll leave it at that. Still plenty of excitement. Still so much else to talk about. You know, whether we're talking about Corbin Burns, Gunnar Henderson now, uh, year two. Full, second full year in the majors, uh, and I saw him hit a ball about 500 feet the first night. Crushed we were down it. there Wednesday. Crushed night. it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he's he had another long home run on Sunday. Uh, Adley Rutschman, I think, had what hit a 460 foot home run in Fort Myers against the Twins on Sunday. I mean, it's a lot of talent on this ball club, and, and yeah, we can. You know, I, I've got some questions about the rotation as it's presently constructed. Uh, when you don't have Bradish and John Means in there right now. I certainly have some questions about the bullpen and will continue to. Uh, And I think that I still think that's an area that they need to improve between now and the trade deadline. Uh, But is this where I quote the great Luke Jones and say, we'll talk about it until it's fixed. Is that that, that, (laughs) or or until the next Felix Batista emerges, you know, someone right. else that they fixed and then you're someone like, fixes cow. it, right. or the next Yen Yer Cano uh, emerges. So look, it's okay to have some question marks about this team. Every team has question marks right now. There's no perfect team out there. I mean, we thought the Dodgers might've been the closest to it. Oh my gosh. Shohei Otani. I mean, who knows what's going to happen with that scenario? Uh, I bet that that's going to be trouble. Uh, I mean, very well could be. I mean, it's yeah. certainly a distraction at the very least. Uh, even if it turns out okay for them. So all teams have questions. Uh, and, but at the same time, this is a really, really good ball club and coming off of a really exciting season. And and normally when you say this, when everyone's a year older, that tends to have a, a negative connotation because you t- typically think of more veteran-laden clubs. This team being a year older, it's a great thing. Uh, you know, it's great that Gunnar Henderson's a year older. It's great that Adley Rutschman's a year older. I'm really looking forward to seeing Jordan Westberg first full year in the majors. I think he's a real, uh, you know, maybe not X factor, but I think he's a wild card for them in terms of if he can give them, you know, m- more premium offense from the lower third of the order. I mean, that lineup just gets so much deeper. So, well, the know, five I, I of think... these veteran guys, and you spent time with Hayes, Mullins, Santander, the guys that are the core guys, the guys that have been here. It feels like Rutschman's a core guy, and it feels like Anderson's a core guy. They, yeah. I mean, Rutschman had been up two years. So, like, I, but I think the guys that were, along this pathway for a period of time we don't talk about them much we really don't you know because we they were they were a little bit more automatic or perceived to be until such point where they break down or to or get expensive or to the point where colton Kowser comes up and says i'm better than you austin hayes i'm yeah you know i'm, I'm just better than what you're doing and you're costing more and i don't know where that is with him mm-hmm. Kerstad, any of these young guys right well i, I think that's why this year for me is I don't know if it's the inflection point, although it, it is Santander's in a contract year. You know, he's going to be a free agent this coming fall. But I do think it's an interesting time because you have these three incumbents and this will be what the fourth straight opening day where those three guys, assuming they don't have Santander DHing or anything like that. This will be the fourth straight opening day where those three guys have been their starting outfield. I mean, that's some impressive continuity. Remember four years ago, all we could talk about was, well, the in, the outfield looks pr- promising. You know, that was kind of the one thing that you talked about. That was they probably terrible. haven't had a lot of years in forever where it was Singleton, Bumbry, and Renicky, Lowenstein, yeah. you know, whatever it is. Well, and through all the I mean, D- 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 Devereaux, Anderson, you know, even then there was a different. Dewey Evans was a right fielder for a minute. You know, sure, sure, but but this is going to be an interesting time because Santander is going to be a free agent. Hayes and Mullins have one more year of team control after this year. Mullins is coming off of an injury plagued year. Austin Hayes, he was an all star the first half of last year. Second half numbers, not as good. Uh, you know, and and that's that's been a couple years for him. He's excellent in the first half and he tends to wear down. What does that tell you? That doesn't mean he's washed up, but now this is where it's interesting. Colton Kowser is on the club. You know, that was uh, officially made known on Sunday. Uh, I'm in, I, I don't view this outfield in terms of, the three incumbent starters and Colton Kowser's playing twice a week. I think that's the wrong way to go. I think for everyone's sake to maximize all of these guys, knowing that 
Santander, he slowed down a little bit in the outfield defensively. Uh, not saying he can't play out there, but does he need to be out there seven days a week? No. Uh, Cedric Mullins certainly could benefit from getting him off his feet a little bit more here and there. That's why I think it's important for them to have Austin Hayes, to have Colton Kowser, to have Jorge Mateo, who can fill in uh, in center field or left field from time to time. Uh, you want to keep these guys fresh. I don't think that Santander, Hayes, Mullins, I don't think the plan on paper should be that each of those guys plays 155 plus games. I think this is much more at a time. And look, to be clear, kowser has got to prove it when he goes out there and plays. He's got to be way better than he was last summer when he got called up. There's no doubt. You know, this isn't a scholarship s- scenario. This is a scenario that for would me. be the case for Holiday. If Holiday came up and hit a buck 20 the first three weeks, sure, you'd, have to, sure. you'd have to send his ass out. And you don't want to do that to that kid either, really. Sure. I mean, there. but like I said, guys are always going to struggle. Now, you don't want it to be that extreme, though. So, I, I, and I'll hear that point. And they ended up sending Kowser back down. But I think... What for me the sweet spot? They send Rodriguez back down. I mean, all these guys have had have been disappointed at one point. I mean, other than Rutschman and Henderson, this is it's a different world when you bring a kid up when they're 20, 21 years old and they're a rookie and they stick and they stay and they're team captain and like that shows that you managed it well to begin with. I think the part for Elias to go back three minutes into this segment because I didn't even said this to you in the car over the week. Mm-hmm. But, like, the last thing you want to do as a GM is bring the guy up and then have to have tail between your legs if you send him back down if he's not ready. That once we sure. call him up, he's here to stay. Because sure. that, that's an emotional thing you know about mm-hmm. where Kowser, Rod, all these guys that got shipped out, that, that's a that's a tough day for a young guy to, to make it and then wind up back in Norfolk. That eats guys up. And you don't want to do that to a 20-year-old kid. It is. It is. And certainly that was part of the consideration. But to go back to Kowser, what I would like to see for him to start the year and then, hey, this is all going to be how everyone performs. You know, it's competitive. It's, good, it's a good roster. But I would like – I don't want to see him only playing once or twice a week. I want to see him playing three, four times a week. And what you, how you do that is Anthony Santander – DHs, or he gets a day off. Uh, Cedric Mullins, once a week, gets a day off. Austin Hayes gets a day off. DH is another day. And you can cycle in, and I'd like this to really, if this goes the way that I think they would like it to go, I think you'd like it to be where they view it that they have four starting caliber outfielders, and you can get guys off their feet. And the idea is, okay, none of these guys need to play 155 games, but if I can get, and you know, I'm just, the math off the top of my head is not going to be right here, but you know, if, if they're more in the range of, you know, let's say Kowser's on the lower end, but none of the, the, the three veteran incumbents are over 140, let's say, or 135. The idea is you're hoping that they are fresher and more productive over six months then, and you're keeping them healthier. And, and I think that's what you want to see because change is coming. They're not, ex- I, I mean, I'm going to sit here right now, they're not extending Santander, Hayes, and Mullins. Maybe they extend one of them. Maybe. I, I'm not convinced that they're going to extend any of them. But you've got to find out while they're still here what you have with Kowser and what you're going to have with Heston Kerstad. And funny what- you said they extend those guys. They can extend all three of those guys. will still cost less than given the money they're going to have to give to any of the big guns once, sure, sure. once Rubenstein but, uh, gets in here this week. You know? but the so point from, is- from a financial perspective, the reason they won't extend those guys is because they're going to have so much money into other people, I believe, right? Well, there, but there's that. And also, well, you know, this farm system, but again, this should be it should be a combination Right. I mean, the farm system isn't about all every single young guy that you develop replaces your old guys. Now, that happens in some cases. I mean, Trey Mancini was replaced. Right. We saw that. But at the same time, you you, you kind of want the churn needs to be a combination. Right. You want to be able to trade some of your young prospects that might not have a path, might not be a guy that you view as a dude, but someone else might view as a dude. And when I say a dude, that's lingo for he's a legit major league player. That's going to be really good. Uh, so, you know, the, I'm guessing the Orioles didn't think Joey Ortiz was going to be a dude. And that's probably why they didn't call him up last year, other than a cup of coffee. And that's why they traded him uh, as part of the package for Corbin Burns. Uh, but they traded him at a point where he didn't rot in triple a for a couple of years. And suddenly everyone's saying, Hey, is he a quad a player? And that's, that's where I'm a little concerned with where they are at with Kyle Stowers right now, for example. I mean, a year and a half ago, people were really excited about Kyle Stowers. And look, he was never a top 50 prospect in baseball or anything like that. But, you know, 
good prospect and had a great spring and there's no room for him. And, and it's tough. I mean, I empathize for him, talked at his locker on, on Friday and he's, uh, he was upset. I mean, I think he understood the reality of where he is in the pecking order, but he was upset because he had a heck of a spring. But the point is, I think now for Elias, for this organization, specifically with the outfield, but it's also going to apply in the infield here. You have to look at these veteran guys and look, it is very easy to, to be nostalgic about the guys that were here when they were losing 110 games. But you also understand you have guys on the way that are going to be younger, cheaper, and they might be better. And, and that's where you have to find out because, you know, extending Austin Hayes and Cedric Mullins and, and you know, Santander, I'd, I'd have a different conversation about depending on his role uh, because he gives you plus power uh, that those guys don't give the same home run power. But from a, an investment standpoint, Nestor, those are not the type of players you invest in into their 30s, especially if you have a farm system of young outfielders that are on the way. So they've got a, it, it's a, it's a balancing act here. And that's why I think it's important for them to get Kowser in the lineup regularly. And hey, it might be that halfway through the year, you realize that Colton Kowser might be their second best outfielder. I have no idea. I'm not predicting that. But if that's the case, then guess what? The trade deadline could look differently then in terms of what you're looking for. And maybe you trade a veteran outfielder at that point in time. You know, I thought that, that there was a decent chance that was going to happen this off se- this past offseason, uh, given the fact that each of those veterans are you know, further along in arbitration, getting more expensive. Not that I'm in the business of, you know, not that I have any interest in saving the Orioles money. I'm just talking in terms of what Mike Elias and Sig Dell do, which is player valuation, right? You have to figure out what you think a player is worth and what he's going to be worth next year and, and all of that. So they're definitely at a point now where, you know, they're going to have to make some tough decisions. And it might be that a guy that's been here for a few years, he might get dealt at the trade deadline. And 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 when someone hears me say that, saying, well, what are you doing? You're trying to win. Well, you're creating a spot for someone that you feel very confident is better th- than them. I mean, you know, they didn't bring back Adam Frazier. Why? Because they have Jordan Westberg and they have Jackson Holiday on the way, you know, sooner than later. So, you know, I mean, that's that's how this works. That's why they traded off Trey Mancini when they did. I mean, that's why they dealt other veterans a few years ago. Now, they were terrible at the time, but they felt, well, that guy's making too much money compared to this guy coming up that we think has some promise. So, you know, that 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 those questions are difficult because it goes back to what we were just saying. These incumbents have a higher floor because they're a known commodity at the same time. You don't want to sell yourself short on a player that might have a much higher ceiling. That's ready to go. So that's where I'm hoping for the Orioles sake, for, for this fan base's sake and for where their roster is going in terms of the next couple of years, you want Colton Kowser to rake this year. You want him to come up to your point, look way better than he did last year and put him in, be so good that Brandon Hyde saying, heck, I, I've got to get him in the lineup. And what does that mean for, Hayes or what does that mean for Mullins or what does that mean for Santander? You know, they're going to sit a little bit more than they have in the past. And look, that would be a great problem to have. You know, that's what you want. You want to have too many options. You want to have too many guys that you're trying to pencil into the starting lineup every night. So I I think that's, you know, we're getting closer and closer to that point where there are going to be be some tough decisions and it doesn't automatically mean you trade prospects, although that's what, you know, could end up happening with a Kyle Stowers, let's say. Uh, in the right deal, but it might be that you trade a veteran because Colton Kowser's proven that he needs to be a guy that plays 150 games moving forward. Uh, so, you know, that that's kind of what you're hoping for. Now we'll see how it plays out. The, you know, the, the our, as Buck show Walter always said with issues such as that, our curiosity will be satisfied. Uh, and I think we're going to find that out. And in the meantime, I, I think this team's position to, to win a heck of a lot of baseball games, uh, even if there are, some question marks here and there, especially on the pitching side for me. Luke Jones still misses Buck Walter, but uh, he'll settle I on do. Brandon Hyde, uh, uh, manager of the year, another candidate this year. Sure. Um, they're the best team in baseball or perceived to be here going into the season uh, in regard to their, their organization, in regard to depth, in regard to, quite frankly, intrigue with new ownership, all sorts of things going on. We'll be down at the ballpark this week. You can find Luke at Baltimore. Luke, we are in Florida at least for the next 48 hours until we get back at the NFL owners meetings. He is Luke. I am Nestor. Happy opening day to everybody. We are WNST. We never stop talking. Baltimore, positive.